the scripture reading before the lesson this evening will be Matthew 20, 17 through 19. Matthew 20, 17 through 19. As Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took 12 disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will, be condemned, they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. Well, good evening. I would ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew, the 20th chapter. In just a minute, uh, we'll begin our lesson from there. If you have some that are visiting with us, we are very thankful that you are here. If you have any questions, please make sure that you ask. Um, our goal is to get to heaven. And if you can help us with that, we would love that. And if we can help you with anything, we would love that opportunity. In class, I said, can anything good come from Kansas City? You may remember, and I was informed that Libby Tabor was from Kansas City, so I apologize for, uh, for that. One thing. I want to talk about time. I want to talk about our Savior from the standpoint of what it was like the last week of his life. What he was focusing on. What would you be focusing on? What would I be thinking about? Our Savior obviously had the unique opportunity to know exactly when he was going to die, how he was going to die. Fortunately, or unfortunately, how you like to look at it, we do not. I'm glad we don't. But what would that last week be like for you? How are we living our lives and making the most of the time that we have? I appreciate this song. We'll sing it uh, as the imitation song in just a minute. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. What's your story? What do you want to leave as your story? When people think about you in your life, what do they see while you're still alive? And what legacy or what does your story show? Is it really to praise my Savior all the day long? Is it in everything that I do, I'm letting my light shine, whether I'm at school or at work or here? Wherever I am, am I making the most of the time that I have been blessed with? We fall into the false view of thinking there's always a tomorrow. Always. And the reality is that is not true. We have right now. But our Savior, in Matthew the 20th chapter, knew what was coming. He knew in chapter 21, as he's going to go into Jerusalem, why he was going to Jerusalem what was going to happen in Jerusalem. And he chooses to use the time that he has to focus on other people. So over in Matthew, the 20th chapter, I want you to notice what is going on. He tells, as was just read by Ty, he just told the disciples exactly what is going to happen. If you ever wonder, did Jesus ever tell them what was going to happen? I think Matthew 20, 18 and 19 make it pretty clear what was going to happen? Behold, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And we will hand him over, and we'll hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised. I think he had it. He understood what was coming. Right? We we got it. The apostles were told exactly what was going to happen. What does this chapter tell us that the disciples were doing? Arguing. We're on our way to Jerusalem. And what comes up? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Is there a way that my sons can sit on your right and left hand, as it talks about in verse 20 and 21? John and James' mom ask. Jesus answers that question, but in verse 24 it says, In hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. Why should you sit there? I should sit there. Now Matthew's account 
makes it pretty interesting if this is chronological, and it's probably not exactly. But you think about, he just said, I am going to die. And the next verse says, their mom came up and asked if they could sit with them. Can they sit on your right hand, on your left hand? You imagine what is going on at this time, whether it's right after or around the same time. We certainly know it's around the same time. They're heading into Jerusalem. He knows what's coming. He just said it. And they're arguing. They're fighting with each other. In chapter 19, we're told that Jesus was still being tested by people. The Pharisees, in verse 3 of chapter 19, says, Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Again, he knows what's coming. And there's testing going on. There's arguing that is going on. People are wanting to have his time, as all of us would want to. In chapter 19 and verse 13 and 14, you have children that are brought to him. And they're trying to keep the children away. And Jesus says, let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It goes a little farther and it talks about this young ruler that comes up to him and begins to talk to him. What would you do? How do we spend our time? As I said, he knows exactly what is coming. We read 18 and 19. If you look at verse 28 of Matthew 20, he says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He knows what is coming. And he decides, obviously, that he is going to focus on other people. And that was okay. He understood what the point was. What the big picture is. How many of us, if you stopped right now and you thought about your life and what it has shown, is that you've left people the story that you were just so worried about everything? You just worry about everything. Have you ever met anybody like that? I know you have. You just worry about everything. You're just too busy for your own good. All the different things that we get caught up in in here and now. When all we want to do is leave this wonderful story of being a great child of God, being a wonderful spouse, being a wonderful parent, whatever the case may be. And yet when the time that we have, which is right now, we spend so much time on things that just don't matter. They don't matter. We are so blessed to have the time that we have right now. Don't fall into the idea that there's always going to be a tomorrow. Make the most of the time that you have. Psalm 145. I could not believe that Tyler brought up Psalm 145 this morning, but Psalm 145. David is writing, and he tells us what he's going to do every day. And this is a psalm, obviously, and it's something I think that we can do as We just looked at blessed assurance. In verse 1, he says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Right off the bat, every day I will bless you in verse 2. Every day. I'm going to wake up every day, and I'm going to live my life To God. He goes on and he talks about one generation is going to praise to another generation. What about us? Are we teaching the children, the next generation, how to praise the God Almighty? What truly matters in this life? In verse 6, he says, Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and shall joyfully of your righteousness. All the things that our God has done. Are we eager to tell other people about them? Are we talking about them to our children, to our family? He goes on, and if you look at verses 8, 14, and 17, and 20, where he talks about The Lord is gracious and merciful, verse 9. The Lord is good to all, verse 14. The Lord sustains all who fall, 17. The Lord is righteous, verse 20. The Lord keeps all who love him. 
just time and time again of all the things that we can praise God for. But what happens to us so often is that we're just too busy. We get too busy. I've said this many times, and I absolutely believe it to be true. It is amazing how often we find time to do the things that we want to do. We're not too busy all the time. We may be too busy when it's something that we don't really want to do. Or something that maybe not be as, as important as other things. But when it's something that you really want to do, it's like Red Sea parted. Time. Not plenty of time. I don't have time to sit in my Bible, but I can watch a sporting event for a couple hours. Of course, no problem. It's not an issue. And I love sports, so please don't misunderstand me. We've got to understand that when it comes to being too busy, all this is a wonderful excuse that you can make. We have the opportunity to show the next generation, show our children, show our grandchildren, what the true power of our Almighty God is. There are people that are so worried about this time in our lives. They're so worried about the culture, so worried about everything that's going on. And you know what you can do about it? Tell people about God. Talk about Him. That's what He says is going to change hearts. That's what causes the next generation to understand His greatness and who He is. Who's going to do that if it's not us? I assure you, no one. We have an opportunity to understand the things that are before us. To stop looking at things as obstacles and to view them as the opportunities that they are. To let our light shine in every situation that we find ourselves in. Even if you are busy, and you are, I know you're busy. Even in those things, letting your light shine. It is amazing to me when you think about relationships that we can have. I cannot imagine going up to Jamie and saying, I'm just too busy to talk to you ever. And it going well. And yet we'll go up to God and say, I'm sorry I haven't talked to you in a week. I've been too busy. Or I forgot to pray. Or I forgot to read. Or I forgot to meditate on his word. I forgot about God. That's the most important relationship in my life, though. No, it's not. We understand it in every single other relationship. You imagine parents, you're so busy. I'm so busy. I forgot to feed those things that live in my house. What? Can you imagine that? And yet we don't feed our children the spiritual food that they need. And don't blink about it at all. Don't even think twice. We have an opportunity to make the most of these times, of the present that we have. It is amazing when you go back to Matthew, the 20th chapter, and you think about our Savior and what his story was going to be. The last week of his life is so amazing to me, and we're not going to obviously get into it all tonight. But he knows, again, what is coming. And he makes the most of every opportunity. He washes their nasty feet. He does all these things to teach people. Finds time for people. We'll see in just a minute. And as he's on his way, leaving Jericho in Matthew, the 29th chapter, or excuse me, verse 29 of Matthew 20. He says, as they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. And two blind men sitting by the road, hearing the that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly told him, them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. It is an amazing story to understand what these people saw. They're blind, physically, obviously. But they understood and saw him to be the Lord, the son of David. Have mercy on us. They understood that he could help 
They certainly were willing to follow him for what he was able to do for them and who he was. And I've said this before, and this is one of my favorite parts of any of these stories. He is the first face that they ever saw. That is awesome. He healed them. That is even amazing to even consider. But when you think about this story, we kind of skipped over a group that was mentioned here that we a lot of times fall into. And that's the crowd. What was the crowd trying to get these two men to stop doing? Stop talking. You're embarrassing us in front of Jesus. Stop. Don't, don't talk. How often that's us. We can fall into that category so quickly. As I said, do we see obstacles or opportunities? Jesus is moved with compassion, as he is often. We're going to look at another passage in just a minute. And he heals them, and they follow him. But I want you to imagine what this had to have been like. Jesus stops, it says in verse 32, and he calls them. You imagine him coming through the crowd. They come over to him, and he heals them. Jesus wasn't concerned about the crowd. He didn't care what they thought. I assure you there were people still around him that were testing him. His concern was for those men at that time to heal them, had compassion for them. Even his last week on earth, prior to his death, his concern was for others. While on the cross, his concern was for others. And after he rose, his concern was for others. And today, his concern is for others. It is never a waste of time to spend time helping other people, talking to other people, taking the time out of your life to make sure that you're reading, that you're praying, that you're studying God's word, meditating on it, that you're talking to other people, that you're letting your light shine. It never is a waste of time. Our Savior, in many, many cases, and I'm not going to read, obviously, every case that he does this, but it's fascinating to me, like Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse 35, again, talking of his compassion. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like the sheep without a shepherd. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It is never a waste of time. He had compassion for them. He was willing to touch the lepers. He was willing to talk to those who many people would have deemed to be unworthy. What about us? What about us? We have an opportunity to introduce Jesus Christ to a lot of different people in our lives. We need to make the most of it. There are people that fill that void with horrible things, addictions, all sorts of things. And Jesus Christ is the answer. And if you've already made up your mind that I can't talk to them about him, who's going to? He's the one that's able to help. He's the one that's able to heal. But too often as the crowd, we did deem people to be not worthy. What's the story of your life? Our God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 3, beginning, says, This is the good and acceptable, acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that us? Do we want all men to be saved like our Father does? All men to be saved. Not all American, only men or people, all people to be saved. Does that describe us? Our God wants all men to be saved. And his children need to want to have all men to be saved because every soul has a value. 
Matthew, the 21st chapter, as, our Jesus, as Jesus is going into Jerusalem, it talks about him being in the temple. We obviously know uh, he's going to clean out the temple, obviously, here. But I want you to notice verse 14. So verse just in the middle of all this, it says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Very quick verse. In the midst of what we normally talk about, which is the fact he was overturning things and running people off, but you know what he does to the people that needed the help, that were deemed to be unworthy? He healed them. He healed them. All souls have value. What's your story in your life? The time is now to make sure that we are right with God. The time is now to make sure that we are living our life the way that we actually want to live it. I've said this before. I've done enough funerals to know when people get to the end of their life, there's always the wish factor. I wish I would have spent more time. I wish, well, us as living people now have the opportunity to implement that now. Don't make it a wish. Do it. Do it. Spend more time with your family if that's what you want to do. Read God's word more if that's what you need to do. Pray to him more if that's what you need to do. But the time is now to stop pushing it off and thinking that things are going to change down the road. Because I'm going to tell you, what I've noticed in my 20 years of preaching, a little longer than 20 years, it doesn't get any slower time. It gets quicker. And I seem like I have less of it which isn't the case. So pushing things down the road is, some of you are retired and you're busier now than ever. How can that be? Because time and life happens for all of us. Make the most of the time that you have. If you are not a child of God, you have the opportunity. Our Savior was going to Jerusalem to die for you, to die for me. He knew full well what he was about to go through. And he knew full well that I was going to need that sacrifice. You were going to need that sacrifice. And that your soul, my soul, was worthy for his death, for him to die for. As we said in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verse 28, to pay this ransom for many. We all have the opportunity now to make sure that our lives are right with him. We're going to sing the song, Blessed Assurance. The amazing thing, as Tyler talked about this morning, it's blessed assurance. He wants you to be his child, but it's up to you whether or not Jesus is yours. That's your decision. That's what we're going to sing, but that's based on how we live. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time. Always make sure you're praying for one another, encouraging one another. But if there's anything that we can do for you, ask you to please come as we stand and sing. Bless